Hi everyone, welcome to another video lecture from Tom Kennedy Science. And I'm of course your host, Dr. Tom Kennedy. Okay, now enzyme activity. This chart shows you something very important. Temperature is incredibly important for um, enzyme activity, right? For a reaction to happen, the, the, the substrates, the reactants have to come together, right? So whenever you heat something up, you have more kinetic energy, right? These things are moving around faster. So the rate of encounter increases. And since they're moving faster, they have more kinetic energy. They're more likely to hit, hit hard enough to break the bonds and then form new chemicals. Now, there's a lot of different life out here. We have uh, things like psychophiles, which are animals that can, or not animals, but they are archaeans and bacteria that can live in very cold environments. We even have fish that live in Arctic and Antarctic waters up underneath the ice. And their enzymes are tailored to working in those freezing to near freezing environments. There are archaeans and bacteria that live in water that's so hot it boils. I know, it's crazy. And the enzymes and the proteins can survive in those environments. And then in humans, our enzymes are optimized to run best at around 98 to 100 degrees. Okay? So depending on the organism and where they're in their environment that they're found, uh, enzymes and proteins are optimized for that temperature. Now, if you look at that chart, you're going to see that the rate increases, 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 and then boom, it drops off. When that rate drops off, you have too much kinetic energy for that enzyme. It denatures and it loses biological function. And a real problem of our enzymes denaturing is you can cool them back down. That doesn't mean that they'll revert back to their original form. Okay, not only are enzymes optimized for temperature, they are optimized for pH. Remember, pH is a measure of your potential of your hydrogens, right? So as you become more acidic, you have more protons in solution. Okay, for all you chemistry buffs, I know it's hydronium, but let's just talk about protons. They're positively charged and they are incredibly active. You go the opposite way, you become more and more alkaline. You get more and more hydroxyl groups. Guess what? They are also reactive. And it also changes the charge too, right? You go from negative to positive as you go from alkaline to acidity. Guess what? That definitely affects enzymes. You know, it's interacting with those functional groups. And so enzymes are definitely optimized for specific pH. Even in our body, our pH varies quite a bit. Our blood is a little bit alkaline. Our pH in our stomach Oh my gosh, almost all the way down to one. And you'll learn an animal form and function about how chloride and proton chloride channels and proton pumps uh, are able to acidify your stomach. But what's interesting is you've got these stomach enzymes that can survive in that really acidic environment. Then your stomach empties into your small intestines, like you get your duodenum, your jejunum, and the pH goes up to almost being slightly alkaline. And then you have a whole nother suite of enzymes there that are optimized for that alkaline environment. And those enzymes, you, you can't have a stomach enzyme working in your small intestine. Just like you cannot have an enzyme in your small intestine will never work in your, in your stomach. They would almost denature instantaneously. And you know, you've seen proteins denature. You've thrown an egg on a frying pan, right? It goes from liquid to solid. You cool it down. It doesn't go back to being liquid. It remains solid even if it's cold. And then, you know, uh, you can see this also um, with fish. I, not everybody likes to eat fish. Not everybody eats meat, and that's okay. But I, I really, I grew up on, in, on the coastal community in North Florida. I've been eating fish my entire life. And surprisingly, we never ate salmon until I came out here, partly because I couldn't get mullet to eat. Uh, mullet's not a haircut. It's actually a fish. But here's some salmon. And if you go to the market and you buy some raw salmon or... You go and eat some raw salmon for sushi. The, the proteins in the mussels that form the fish have a certain texture. And that texture changes if you cook it. You notice on the right, you got that nice flaky salmon. It looks very different. It's got very different uh, uh, texture to it. And also, you can do the same thing. If you marinate salmon or your fish in lemon juice, over a few hours, your salmon looks like it's been cooked. And that's because the acidity of the lemon juice is also denaturing those proteins, similar to the way uh, extra heat does. So that's a good way to see those proteins denature. Okay, now here's really quickly. Enzymes don't work alone, right? You've got cofactors. 
those are the inorganic ions like zinc, magnesium, and iron. And these are really important, right? Remember when I told you like in the origins of life, probably in a hydrothermal vent, you had all these metal ions just kind of lining those little vents and they were facilitating, they were catalyzing all these chemical reactions. A lot of our enzymes still use zinc and magnesium and iron at the core of their active site and the rest of the protein enzyme is just there to get the substrates in there, just to get the reactions lined up nicely. We also have coenzymes. Now these are organic molecules and they interact together with the enzymes. And like a good example of a coenzyme would be NAD plus and FAD. So those are your electron carriers. And then creating uh, molecules isn't often done in just one step. So we might have multiple steps to make uh, an amino acid, right? So then we would have a metabolic pathway that might involve like eight enzymes to create a single um, amino acid. Or in the case of glycolysis, which is an exergonic reaction, we're gonna break down glucose. Glyco means glucose, lys means to split apart. Glycolysis requires 10 different enzymes all occurring in, uh, in a row to break down um, glucose into another molecule called pyruvate. So you don't have a single enzyme often working alone. They, they've got these cofactors, they've got coenzymes, and they may work as part of a series of um, chemical reactions as a metabolic pathway. Okay, now you got these enzymes and uh, they, they're, they're constantly working, right? But you know, you make an enzyme, it's a large energy investment for your cell to go through transcript. Well, you haven't learned transcription translation, but basically there's a lot, a lot of time and energy spent in making proteins. But you, so you don't want to just build them up, build them back down and take them back down again. You do want to maybe inactivate them, turn them on, turn them off whenever you need them. So enzymes are regulated and there's a couple different ways you can do this. Now, one of the ways we're just going to regulate the enzyme by changing the active site. Remember the active site is a lock and key fit. So the substrate is going to bind in there just perfectly. You can see the substrate fits the active site. So any change you do to the active site, guess what? You've turned that enzyme off. And remember, we're not denaturing it. We're just going to turn it off. So one way is to have a competitive inhibitor. And a lot of times your competitive inhibitor is the product of your metabolic pathway. So if you're making, uh, I don't know, I, if you're making ATP, actually this is in cellular respiration, ATP, I don't know if it's an actual competitive inhibitor, but you can imagine the products of your metabolic pathway will actually bind into the active site and that prevents your reactants from getting in there and that slows down the rate of your reaction. And then as you use up your 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 uh, the, the molecule you're trying to make, there's less of it, the enzyme becomes more active again. Okay, so that's competitive inhibition. The other one is non-competitive inhibition. Also, this is allosteric uh, inhibition as well. Allo just means away from. And steric has to do with shape, right? So a non-competitive inhibitor. You've got your enzyme. You've got the active site where the reactants are going to bind. If I come at another place in the enzyme that's not the active site and bind to it and cause the active site to change where your substrates can't bind to it, then you've turned off that um, that enzyme, at least temporarily, because in your non-competitive inhibitor, once again, might be the product of a metabolic pathway. And in, as you use up your product, they come off the enzymes, the enzymes will once again begin to work as well. So I use that word allosteric, and I just use it as allosteric inhibition, which basically means the you could have the product binds to your, your enzyme at a different location, changes the active site, turns off the enzyme. Okay, there's also allosteric activation. Now, I'm going to come back to this. I'm going to state it a couple times here. Proteins are not rigid structures. They can change shape. Now, this is different from denaturing. Denaturing is changing shape that it loses biological function. But you can imagine that proteins are constantly changing shape. And with our enzymes and other proteins as well, they might be bouncing back and forth between on and off, on and off, activated, inactivated. So allosteric activation, what will happen here is you've got some activator. It lands onto a specific place on the enzyme and 
activates the enzyme and it basically locks in the active sites and keeps them all open and the and that uh that enzyme is now activated and when the activator comes off the active sites go back to being inactive because the the substrates cannot bind to them so with allosteric remember we can have activators and inhibitors that are basically activating or inactivating our proteins turning them on turning them off and there's also cooperativity as well and this is something that you'll learn a little bit about when you start learning about bore shift and things like that in animal form and function you know the more oxygen your hemoglobin carries the it starts binding to oxygen guess what the next oxygen binds to your hemoglobin is easier oxygen comes off it makes it easier for it to unload so cooperativity is you might have a substrate will go in there binds and it will change the protein the enzyme so that it stabilizes it into an active form as well and that's a little bit different from allosteric activation right because allosteric is you're not your activators and your inhibitors are not binding to the active site but in cooperativity, one is binding to one of the active sites and it makes the other active sites open. And there's a molecule, you're gonna learn about it, a large protein complex called Rubisco. It's a ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase. Oh, I know that's a lot of words, ribulose, think sugar. Um, well, anyway, uh, Rubisco or is, uh, is an enzyme used in photosynthesis and it has many active sites on it as well. Okay, so like I said, um, a, a large protein complex, a large enzyme may have more than a single active site. Okay, and this is just kind of summing up the allosteric activators and inhibitors and also the cooperativity between these things. And then lastly, I stated this earlier, you know, enzymes work together, right? They, they form these metabolic pathways and a metabolic pathway is a series of chemical reactions, okay? And then we don't need to regulate every single enzyme in that series of reactions, right? Because what you can do is you can actually turn off the pathway at the start of it. So in this one, if you are a cell, you need isoleucine. Isoleucine is one of your um, amino, one of the 20 amino acids you need. If you have lots of isoleucine, don't go make more. That's a waste of energy, right? So isoleucine, the product of this metabolic pathway, will bind allosterically to like the very first enzyme of this metabolic pathway and shut it down. And then as your cell uses up the isoleucine, there's less of it to inhibit your, your very first step, and the metabolic pathway starts up again. Glycolysis is the same way. As if you're producing a lot of ATP, but you're not exercising, you don't want a lot of ATP floating around in your cells. So ATP will actually bind some of the very first steps of glycolysis and shut down glycolysis, which slows down the entire rate of cellular respiration inside of our cells. Okay. Well, I hope that explains a little bit about enzymes and enzyme activity here. And like I said, you know, that's the classical view of how enzymes work, that they are lowering the activation energy by doing an induced fit. And interestingly, you know, in the next decade or so, just to show that science is constantly changing, we may be learning that enzymes actually take advantage of quantum tunneling, and that's where the enzymes actually uh, line up the, the, re the substrates, the reactants, so that the electrons can go through, go th right through the energy barrier, like a ball going through a mountain or a hill, and just popping up on the other side. You know, I guess we can kind of think of that in some ways. You know, radio waves clearly go through walls. So there you go. There's a good analogy. And for anybody ever who watched the movie Men Who Stare at Goats, oh, that's a fantastic movie. It has so many good actors in it. At the end of the movie, um, Obi-Wan Kenobi, not Obi-Wan Kenobi, but they were all Jedis in the movie. But Ewan McGregor runs through a wall, literally. It's a pretty funny movie for, if anybody is interested in that. Okay. This has been another episode of Tom Kennedy Science here talking about enzymes and how they work. Until next time.